First off, I want to thank Mrs. Kalanda for setting that up for me and uh, using some of the jokes that I was going to use. So. <laughs> I don't know how funny that I, I would be. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I definitely count this as a, a high privilege to, to have been invited to speak to you. Um, thank you, Sonia, for the boldness and trust in me. And excuse me, thank you. I have a proper protocol to the administration, administrative team. I see a VP here for uh, when they found out that I would be speaking, they didn't tell your son, you know, you know <laughs> go back and rethink this thing. Go back and rethink this thing. I also want to thank you all for coming to spend your lunch time with me. I trust that I will be a good steward of your time. I want to, off the record and on the record, thank the Periscope audience that's watching. My wife is watching from Atlanta, Georgia, and my family in Chicago, they're watching also. So uh, I'll be on my best behavior. <laughs> I'm totally kidding about that one. I'm totally kidding about that one. I've designed this presentation to be approximately 30 minutes because I want to be as open as you would allow me to be. And any questions that you have about security clearance or anything that I say, I definitely like to give you time to address those questions and I'll do my best to answer them. So hidden figures. Um, those who are involved in STEM, who are of African American, or black, or um, color descent. And I say that because the topic is African Americans. Um, but in the presentation, I use the word blacks. So years ago, years ago, Crawford, I found out it's not necessarily what they call them, it's what you answer to. So, I'll be dropping a few nuggets along the way if you want to catch them, that'll be good. Just to give you a brief outline on how this would go, I'll talk about alternative facts, <laughs> the actual figures. I'll also hit on a subject called Go Figure, giving you some data that the government, I've been with them, I, I was with them for eight years that they've given us. Also, figuratively speaking, some people that you may not have heard of before that I'd like to introduce you to. And lastly, a story that I am so passionate about that I recently read where a young man actually figured it out. Where a young man actually figured it out. Alternative facts. If you have been on the internet or if you've been watching television, you would know that with this, with this idea of alternative facts, um, especially if you've been watching television, because this is the epitome of television telling lies on the vision. The epitome of it. January 22nd of this year, during a Meet the Press talk, we had an interviewer and an interviewee. And the interviewer posed some questions to the interviewee in which he said he did not think some things were true. The interviewee responded to him, well, those are alternative facts. Um, where I'm from, alternative facts just means a lie. <laughs> That's where I'm from. And even if it's the half truth, it's a whole lie. So here are some half truths that we've been Talk, talks that have been listed throughout history. One of the first ones is that um, LASIK surgery was invented by Dr. Payman, who is of Iranian ascent, uh, descent, I should say. And they said in 1989, he invented this world-renowned deal called LASIK surgery. That's the first one. Second one, is that the U.S. Congress put out a paper saying that the most influential female in the civil rights movement was Rosa Parks. And a lot of you all have heard of Rosa Parks. The third one, and I know a lot of y'all, you know, 
you don't care about me on this one, but is that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Just about every, every history book says that's true. Fourthly, that the richest person ever to live was either Rothschild, Rockefeller, or presently Bill Gates. What are these called? Alternative oh, facts. Let's throw that away. <laughs> Actual figures. Dr. Payman did not invent LASIK surgery. He is not the inventor of LASIK surgery. His patent came out in 1989, but Dr. Patricia Babb at the University of California, hers came out in 1987. Secondly, the most influential woman in civil rights was Ella Baker. She was instrumental in the upbringing and the notoriety from people all the way back to W.E.B. Du Bois to Dr. King. And Time Magazine even says that as it relates to popularity of women, she was the most influential. Next, the inventor of the light bulb, Louis Latter. Thomas Edison had a team of people helping him to figure this thing out, just like certain presidents have teams of people helping them to figure it out. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not the person who thinks of the idea, it's the one who makes the idea known. Not only did he help with the invention of the light bulb, but he also helped with the invention of the telephone. Very, very smart and an individual who was way before his time. Lastly, the richest person in the world to ever live was not Rothschild 22 billion. I take that. <laughs> I'll take that. Gates 85 billion or Rockefeller 396 billion. It was a black man who by some estimates was worth $500 billion. $500 billion. But we see this. We see it quite often. And we see it a lot when it comes to the black or African American race, where we are many times underserved or underrepresented in many different parts of the country, but also when it comes to the STEM fields. As it relates to scientists and engineers, currently 1.5% are black as it relates to blacks with doctoral degrees in science and engineering. Even at all levels, 2% are black. As it relates to science faculty, and that's not just at community colleges, but community colleges throughout the US, 4%, not social science, but biological sciences are black, and only 2% are engineering faculty. As it relates to years and how things have happened, between 1926 to 1947, only 12 blacks earned a PhD in mathematics. 1943 to 1969, 13 African American women earned a PhD in mathematics. And understand this, and this is a shot to no one, but there is a difference between mathematics and math education, stats, and mathematical sciences. There is a difference. So for a nearly 10 year period in the US, no black American received a PhD specifically in mathematics within a 10 year period until B. Jaron Richardson came on the scene. Black male from the inner city of Chicago, very poor. He was considered a whiz kid and as much as when he was in elementary school, they sent him to the University of Chicago, the school that is responsible for splitting the first atom. They sent him there as an elementary teacher to teach the teachers. 
He put himself through school by contributing to their textbooks. And he went on to Northwestern University where he became the first black male in a 10 year period to earn a PhD in mathematics. He's only in his 50s right now. Yet he serves on Rush Hospital <coughs> Board. He's a professor at four different universities in this country, including Harvard. When they call, he go because of this particular talent that he has. Shamanique Bodie and Leonardo Palmer, they were my classmates at Wiley College. Both of them are now physicians. Dr. Bodie used to work in Spring, Texas as an OBGYN, but she decided she wanted to go back home to the, to the Bahamas. Dr. Comer is a pediatrician. He went back home to the Bahamas. I had the privilege of speaking at Prince Mary's Hospital, which is the main hospital in the Bahamas, over a period of time to talk about how health and religion go together. <clears throat> While I was there, Dr. Calmer's wife was in a car accident. The car accident in which she was in, she was nine months pregnant. At that particular time, she was trapped in the vehicle, Dr. Calmer's wife. Near fatal accident, the baby was dying. The person who performed the emergency surgery on her was Dr. Bowie. By personal communication, the Bahamas says that this is the first time in the history of that country that two black people who went to the same college in a different country and came back, that one person in that particular class was able to save the wife of another physician. Then we have the great storyteller teller Malcolm Gladwell, one of the best storytellers you ever would meet. Although he's not a scientist, he wrote a paper called The Engineer's Lament. And in that particular paper, he tells how engineers are just like black people. They always want to fix something. <laughs> <laughs> and the story goes on, very inspiring story. But then right after that, an article comes up entitled, Because My Mama Said So. i like to tell you about that article. Probably one of the most impactful articles I've ever read. The story goes this way. There was a lady who had five children, born in poverty. The son who wrote this article was the third of his mother's five children, and she was only 17 when she got pregnant with him. Single parently raised, raised in poverty. The boy writes this story, and he says, life was hard, especially not having a father. Life was hard because the mother would take the children to school with her, sit them outside, and that little boy needed something to do. Fire alarm was near him. Always pulled. Third time he pulled the fire alarm, the administration said, no, we're sorry, but we have to put you out school. So the son writes, he was really sorry, crawled up into mama's lap and said, mama, I'm so sorry I couldn't let you get an education. The mother looks at him and says, son, well, it's my responsibility to get, make, you get one, make you get one. One day, the son came home as he was in, I think the story is seventh grade. He was in seventh grade and uh, came home and I don't know if they even do this anymore, but the story says that the son wanted to go on a field trip 
and had to have a permission slip to be signed. And he said, Mama, I'm so excited about this particular field trip. And he said, is it OK if I get a new outfit for this particular field trip? Mama, who was working three jobs, knew she didn't have the money to do it. But she said, son, you'll have one by tomorrow. The son went to school. Mama went in to a place, uh, I think it said a thrift store, a second hand, a, a hand-me-down store. Bought the son some clothes. And before the son came home, she washed them, she freshened them up, she ironed them, and she put them on a hanger so that the son, when he came home, can think he had some new clothes. So he came in, got the new clothes, he was so excited, went the next day to the field trip, and while he was there, he was bullied. And somebody came up and said, hey boy, you know those not new clothes because there's a stapler in your collar. And I know those staplers come from the thrift store because they tell you how much the clothes are gonna be. He said, furthermore, you're nothing but a, a chump. You, and this, this, this is part of the story that made me laugh. They said, you ain't got nothing but a big head and, some, and you four eyes. So I can identify. <laughs> I can identify. So the boy went home, saw his mother. His mother recognized his countenance. Said, son, what's wrong? Said, mama, my feelings hurt, and I don't want to go back to school. Mother told the son to crawl up in her lap. He said, well, tell me what happened. Said, Mama, I went to school and they told me that I had thrift, thrift store clothes and that my head was big and that my eyes were, I had really bad eyesight. They say I was full eyed and they told me I had Coca Cola bottle glasses. And the mother said, Well, son, I always want to be truthful with you. And you know, your, your clothes did come from the thrift store. And, and, and it is true, son. Um, Looking at the size of your head, it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> he said, and, and you, you, you on, I'm on, I'm on uh, welfare, so I had to get your glasses from the welfare place, and, and they are fit. He said, well, son, I want you to know something. The son said, what's that, mom? He said, um, your head is big because uh, you got a whole lot of knowledge in that head. He said, and, and your eyes, you, you got really, really bad eyesight because because, because God is going to give you good insight. So she, she pulled up the, the, the son. She said, look me, in my, look me in my eyes. Look me in my eyes right now. She said, what do you want to be when you grow up? The son said, I want to be an inventor and a, a doctor. Those two things. She said, okay. She said, well, from now on, I want you to write that down every single day. And the son said, hey, mama, I got something that's, that, that, I, that will help me remember that. And mama said, what? She said, uh, the, the, the son said, if you think it, ink it. If you think it, ink it. So mama said, that's, that, that's good, son, that, that, that's real good. She said, where did you get that from? He said, because of, 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 of the other day I read that most of what you write down, you do. So if you think it, why not ink it? So mother said, great, love it, do it. So what that boy did was every time he went to school, Every time he went to school, he would write his name, and right after writing his name, he would write MD, PhD. <laughs> Every time, that boy ended up graduating from elementary school valedictorian. He went to high school. All the time he wrote on his papers, MD, PhD. Well, he ran into a snag in high school where they put him in remedial courses. Came back home, mom, guess what they did? Mother said, what is that, boy? Said, they put me in these remedial courses. She said, it's okay. Every step that you take leads you to your destiny, even if it's start, even if you have to start on the bottom floor. Mom, that sounds good. Go back to school, kept doing it. Finished high school, number three in his class. Went to college, still writing his name, MD, PhD. He got to his sophomore year in college, physics <coughs> class. The physics teacher called him up there, said, boy, come in. Boy goes up, said, what is this you writing on this paper? He said, well, 
My mama said, <laughs> my mama said if I think it, ink it. Whatever I want to become, she write it down. He said, that crap don't work in here. The boy went to his dorm. What did he do? Called his mama. <laughs> said, mama, my physics teacher told me that this is crap, that all the stuff you said was wrong. And she said to him, son, in life, you will be challenged. But if it does not challenge you, I doubt if it will ever change you. Boy went back, empowered. Finished undergrad, number two in his class. Kept on writing MD, PhD on his papers. Got to graduate school. In graduate school, he had an idea that most graduate programs never done before. And because he was a black male, a lot of programs didn't want to accept him. What did he do? Called home to mama. <laughs> said, mama, this is too hard. I want to give up. Mama said, son, there's nothing in you. There's nothing in you that I'm going to tap into that I'm going to ever allow you to give up on. You're better than you are on your worst day. Son felt what? Empowered. Son found a school in Miami, University of Miami. Went from the University of Miami, studied abroad in the Dominican Republic. Went from the Dominican Republic, studied at UC Davis. Went from UC Davis, studied at Tech. Went from Tech, studied at Alabama. When he got to Alabama, he found out that he was going to be graduating with a degree that no black in eight years in the US had had. What'd he do? <laughs> Called his mama. He said, Mama, um, I want to share something with you. I am uh, up to graduate with a degree that no other black in eight years has, has, has graduated with. The mother said, Son, I'm so proud of you. She said, The boy said, Why? She said, um, He said, Mama said, uh, Here's why. She said, because when adversity comes, and son, you've been through it all. She said, when adversity comes, some people, she said, no, let me take that back, son, because I always said I was going to tell you the truth. She said, son, when adversity comes, most people break down, but you're going to break records. That boy was the first black in eight years to receive a degree in molecular biology. That boy is only one, and it's as of 2008, was only one of 3,000 black scientists in the US to serve and to have this degree. That boy became the first black molecular microbiologist at Cornell University. That boy was the first black scientist with a PhD to work for the United States Criminal Investigation Laboratory. And understand this about that boy. This particular entity right here does not exist on paper. Talking about high security clearance, that boy was a part of the team when they assassinated Osama bin Laden. He did the genetic analysis on Osama bin Laden. That boy received the Living Legend Award in 2012 that boy received the Pioneer in Education Award in 2015. And at his graduation, when they were robing him, he took his degree, and guess what he called to the stage? His mom. And said, Mama, I graduated, but this degree belonged to you. That boy recently became the first science alum to serve as the keynote speaker for Ag Week. And that boy in 2007, 17, is talking to you right now.
I, I did not anticipate your applause, but let me say this. Seriously, let me say this. Accomplishments are not for bragging, they're for building. And if anything that I said, if there's anybody here think, well, I should have finished those two credits. Well, I should have written that book. Well, I should have started that business. Don't stop. Hey, let's all go to the top together because the bottom is really crowded. This is the best school in the nation. Do you know why? Because you're a part of it. That's why. Because each and every one of you are a part of this school right here. And listen to this, I'm done. You have to believe in yourself. I tell people all the time, if you don't like me, I like me. And I'm serious about that. If you make it to this, to the end of your life, to realize you have not lived, it's been a waste. <clears throat> I really appreciate you all listening. Any questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. What initially piqued your interest in, in the medicines and the sciences? Very interesting question, and it's a funny answer. I love babies, and babies do the darnest things. So when I was 11, I told my mother I wanted to, to invent a device that let me know what babies what babies were, think, were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was at about 11. I know, right? That was 11. When I was 17, my niece at nine months, one week, and six days old died. And I could not understand why the doctors couldn't fix her. And so I sort of dedicated a large part of my life to figuring that out. Besides teaching at a community college, um, what other things do you do in your community or in where you grew up to mentor young students like your mom and Mr. Yeah, um, before I came here, I worked at the, well, volunteered at the Neves Davis Detention Center just to go there and offer what we, they call the Juveniles Hope. So I did that every Thursday. Uh, when I went to Cornell, I did the Cornell Prison Education Program where I would go in once a week and teach them biological principles. And many times, and my family who's, who's watching will tell you, I talk to anybody. I talk to anybody. They're on the street. They're just important to me on the street as the president of this college is. So I do a lot of that. I travel um, against my age is <laughs> better judgment because I turned 40 last, last month. I'm on, I, I travel about 50 times a year going to different areas, speaking about science, empowerment, and even here I've been invited to Hayes, Reagan, and Crane Elementary to speak to those, those mm -hmm. students. Yes, ma'am. What are the things you think we can do um, as a society to encourage more people, whether it's African Americans or women or um, other under, underrepresented groups, to be more involved in STEM? Um, first, the, the main thing is to meet them where they are meet them where there are a lot of people won't won't come here some most times we have to go out there the great commission says to go and get them that's that's the main thing also put a face to sometime what they might want to become you know most if you see it i told a, a group the other day it's time for blacks in particular black history month okay it's time for blacks in particular to stop running the court the basketball court it's time for them to start owning the court so give them those resources to help them wherever they are and bring them to where they need to be. Um, the, other, the last thing is to show a short interest. When you care, care for real. Be genuine about, about that. You know, there's a book out by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And one of the first things he said is, when you meet a stranger, make them a friend. Yes, Oh, this is a wonderful story. It really shows a lot of goal seeking behavior that's really, really well instilled. Obviously, we give her some reason to sleep well. So she uh, is she telling? 
Hey, mom. <laughs> love you. Uh, and thanks for that tough love. It, it was tough, but I felt the love in her lips, literally. So the, the follow-up to, to that question is, how do we instill that goal-seeking behavior in our youth of, of Bessemer? Where do you think the safety lies? Where do you think the steps to make an inroad and stuff like that? Well, believe it or not, you're doing it right now by being here. This is a community, this is a community college. Um, there's no person that comes through Thomas S. Crawford's class that does not, even if, even though you're, even though you are who you are, um, <laughs> they, they feel the love in your lips. And at the end of the term, we see it in our SEI data, where they said, this was probably the most difficult class I had, but at least he cared. Um, having a heart with what you do goes a long way. And there's no one simple formula to this. Each person brings his or her uniqueness to, to the table. And some people that may not like the way I do it, may like the way you do it, but as long as we're doing it together, as a family, it takes a village to raise a family, <coughs> and it takes a community to educate our students. So no quick, you know, one-line answer to that, but being there, being available, being honest, being open about your trials and your trips. A lot of us, a lot of people don't have my experience, you know, but that doesn't mean that their experience don't mean anything. Prosper where you plan it. There's value in every one of our values. So telling that story, I, facts tell, stories sell. People can identify with you when you're telling them the truth. When you're telling them this ain't gonna be easy, but if you're willing to walk it, I'll walk this path with you. I just wanna know how you ended up uh, here. Just tell me a little bit background. Yeah. And somebody just picked you up and said, hey, come over here. Or <laughs> Um, not, not really. Uh, I can honestly say with the government, I made a, 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 a good living. And um, one day I was sitting down and I was thinking about my contributions to the government. And I was thinking of a lost world that I'm, I'm always with the government, but I'm never out on the streets. So I, uh, I think as Henry Thoreau said, it's sad to come to the end of your life to only realize you had not lived. And I had a lot, but it was meaningless to me. So I, I, I told myself, uh, Cornell wanted to, they made me an offer to keep me. Um, Georgia made me an offer to keep me. The government, they're still mad at me because they couldn't keep me. Um, and, and I had to suffer great, great pain as a result of the decision to leave the government because they are the government, right? You come out pause. <laughs> because they are the government but I sat down one night and I just thought about my entire life and I, I said I have to give a nation who does not know what my mother gave me and I sought out several community colleges and this is not again this is not bragging but I had four offers to medical schools to teach there before I came here because I wanted to know where can I go to make the biggest difference, not in my life, but in the lives of people? You know, that's why, you know, I was able to see Valerie Jones on that, <laughs> on the other side of that, that, that Skype right there. So that's why. Yeah, I uh, don't know, you know everyone knows this is common uh, knowledge, but I know that you're an ordained minister. Could you tell me how that influenced your path in school? Um, I know how it, how it influences me today. Ordained minister, um, <laughs> that I, I, anybody can tell you I hate titles. I hate titles. People do what, people do with the titles what they can't do with their own name. And so um, I like to say that I'm a lover of people. And me having a penchant for people, I used to go to nursing homes um, where I would get off the bus, a stop before my stop, and go to nursing homes and just walk in there and see what I could do to help. So it's really more a heart and a passion for helping people. And we hear this all the time where people say, well, I went to nursing school, I'm going to nursing school because I care. Um, yeah, you know, who don't? Who don't? But what do you do with that I care? Are you, is it verbal? Is it just verbal? Or are you doing? Compassion to me is love in action. It's just not love, it's when you put, put feet on that love. 
So, um, ordained minister, I would rather just be James. You know, I'd rather be James. But in society, they link titles to people. And most people don't know that I am because I can talk about evolution just as well as I can talk about the creation theory. I can talk about intelligent design just as well as I can talk about amoebas being formed 12 million years ago. So it's, um, in his book, in his book, Becoming, Clinton, Marquise Clinton said, it takes a true person to be able to become. So if you're just one dimensional, how good are you? So, ordained minister, I am ordained. Um, somebody was crazy enough to see something in me to do it. But uh, before they did it, before they ordained me and gave me a card, um, it was a life, it was a life mission. Don. It's in, we live in a, in a very fascinating historic dimension of time. And, 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 and uh, I was taught when I, when I went, to, uh, went to college, I was taught that human beings had 48 chromosomes. Yeah, right. Yeah, I still got the book. <laughs> and then when I, when I went to Columbia, um, it was me, and a, a bunch of other white males, and some Asian guys. No minorities, and I think one woman in science in those in those areas so we've seen a huge a huge change um, not that big I guess but we've seen a, a, a change and the reason I'm bringing this up is that is that you never know when you're in the history that it is the history you know, you know what I mean you never know when, when it's the turning point when it's that but here at Odessa College um, we have extraordinary talents here um, in, in great backgrounds and in, in, living legends, such as yourself. And we're going through a period of interesting history here where we look at STEM education. Let's bring it back to STEM education. And over the last two years, the people going into STEM education here in Odessa has increased about 400%. We have more students in STEM education by advanced than, than we had in the, in the previous, if you added up about 10 years. That's how many new folks are coming into STEM. And what's fascinating is how well they're doing. How well they're doing. And that means that this community, they're the same students that have been around forever in this community, but they never had that support. Your story is a, is a story of, of individual talent rising to the top. But if we're going to actually make a difference, we have to allow all students to rise to the top. We have to support them in ways that, that they haven't been supported. And what we're finding at Odessa College, and you as head of the science department are, are, are it's fascinating that you're here at this particular time, when we have more students in science doing better than they've ever done, we are in effect creating a new history in this region. And as I was telling people the other day, um, in the community colleges in the region, they're not seeing this rise. This is something that's occurring here because of each and every one supporting it, from our student services people to the inspirations in our science department to the hard knuckleheads like what comes here, Hello. And, and, and to, to the inspiration that you bring. So we are starting to live a history here at Odessa College, which will have more minorities doing better, and that hopefully we'll never again have that, that time that, that you've lived, where it takes years, almost a decade, even one individual to make a difference. We can help an entire community make a difference, and if we can do it well enough and talk about it, we can help from here have a nation make a difference. And, and I think uh, you're part of that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Question. <clears throat> Going back to the original topic, individuals. Can both of you all speak to what that topic means to you, or that idea, that concept means to you, and how that impacts what you've done or your experiences, what you're doing? Well, to me, so I graduated from Carver Junior Senior High School in Medford, Texas. We were taught about the back. They, the face of the sport, um, honor society, and all of that. But they closed Carver in 1968. And when they did that, they said, we didn't have anything. To this day, we can't find all the trophies. They didn't, they didn't care about us. And when I left and went to Texas Tech, that was the worst thing in the world. 
and that was they said we could join the fraternity, the, the sororities. I wasn't interested in that. We sat in these big halls for classes, and I'll never forget this white man named Dr. Jones. That was the most racist man in the world. And we sit up there, Hispanics and blacks, literally messing up there. That's what he would say. And they would never have a black playing football, basketball, anything. I won't say much after what Mrs. Farmer had said. I, I totally agree. The, the small piece that I'll add is a 76-year-old white male invited my wife and I to his house. And he said to me, he says, James, why is it that there's so much black on black crime? Why is it that um, on TV I'm seeing this, 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 this? And I said, sir, um, do you know that white on white crime is more than black on black crime? And I said, but you don't hear Asian on Asian crime, but that's, that's a high rate. And he stopped and he said, wait, but the TV told me this. <laughs> I, I cannot make this up. It's like the, the television told me this. And if, if there's one thing that this means to me, it's somebody who did not look like me invited me to his home to get to know more about me because I was hidden behind what television had said. And if you look at this last thing, and I'm done, right? <laughs> if you look at this that last thing, he figured it out. What did he figure out? He figured out this. What you came from many times is what you came for. That's what he figured out. He figured out if you want to know what made him, find out what broke him. So Mr. Mitchell, I'm looking for him. That man that told that, that scratched scratch my name out, I've been looking for him so I could send him a hallmark thank you card. Because he 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 doubted me. And that doubt, that doubt brought, really, really brought me out. I'm a poet and don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm, do you have questions? Oh. Just one more. Um, yes, did your mom ever get to go back and finish her education? She did not. What about the rest of your siblings? Um, all of us are college educated now, yes. Yes, ma'am. I have one question. So, um, well, first of all, I was very um, <coughs> relate to you know, calling my back home to my mama and always asking for approval in the and my father. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that piece and along with your presentation. But my question is, what advice can we give our, our youth, um, you know, specifically to those students who want to go into the STEM field but really don't know where to start and you know, there's those students who are graduating, you know, top ten, or they have the good grades, or there's others who don't, but they're still interested in going in the field. <coughs> they come from, you know, how to look to scholarships, what <coughs> university to choose them. How do they work their way um, to college and getting that um, the, that opportunity? What I would say is, don't 
to, to that student, in which I say to what I, what I say to the class is that honor me by wanting to sign up for my course. Don't let fear paralyze you. Do not let, and I ask them this question, and I ask you this question. What would you do if you knew there was no possibility that you would fail? If you knew there was no possibility of failure, what would you do? And one student raised her hand, she said, I'll do anything I want to do. And I said, as long as it's good, I'm good with that. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Wilson. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I hope we all got something good out of the information that was given. Um, we'll try to continue to have money.